Hello YouTube, we just talked with Gregory Warren from Morningstar. And we talked about economic modes and asset managers. So if you like it, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment. Thank you. Hello Gregory, nice to have you here in Luxembourg at the International Value Investing Conference for an interview. Um, you're working at Morningstar. Can, I, can you please tell us more a bit, a bit more about your background? Yeah, I, I've been with Morningstar about 14 and a half years. Um, was really there sort of in the early days of us picking up a, a large, much larger presence of, of equity research. And then before that, uh, I was a buy side analyst with an investment management shop for about almost a decade. Um, and as far as coverage goes, um, yeah, I, for the 10 years up until I started covering the US-based asset managers in 2008, 2009, uh, I was covering packaged foods, packaged goods, consumer products. Um, uh, they brought me over to the asset managers uh, you know, during the financial crisis, which is probably the worst possible time to be picking up the companies. But uh, uh, within a year, I also started picking up Berkshire Hathaway, which I've covered since. Um, you know, at this point, I pretty much covered the 12 largest U.S.-based asset managers and uh, the three Canadian asset managers. Uh, Morningstar overall, <clears throat> you know, it, it's an interesting shop. Uh, started out as fund research historically, um, really started picking up equity research in the mid 90s, uh, but we uh, b became a much bigger presence uh, during the Spitzer years, you know, the, the, the uh, post settlement um, from the dot com uh, uh, bubble, where, <clears throat> you know, we were one of the recipients of larger sort of independent research contracts. Uh, bought in a lot of analysts to start covering a lot of companies, um, and I was part of that initial wave. And then we've continued to grow the business from there, uh, much more catering now to uh, you know institutional clients, you know fund managers, but also uh, advisory shops. So a, a, a wide array of different kinds of clients that we um, uh, work with. Right now in the U.S., we have I think 65 analysts. Um, we've got another 20 here in Europe. Uh, and also another 20 in the Asia Pacific region. Our longer term aims are to grow uh, the analyst base both in Europe and the Asia Pacific region. Uh, the US is gonna be more about being very selective about companies we cover. So, you know, at the end of the day, our coverage tends to skew more towards modier firms. Uh, and for people not familiar with Morningstar's research, we uh, uh, assess companies based upon their competitive advantages and look at you know five sources of competitive advantage that they could have um, you know to <clears throat> assess whether or not they have an economic moat and then you know we have three different designations a wide moat is a firm that's likely to out you know out earn their cost of capital over 10 to 20 years and a narrow moat firm is at least for the first 10 years and then a no moat firm we just don't have the confidence they can do it over the next 10 years on a consistent basis uh, and that really sort of helps segregate out our list but you know like i was saying from a coverage perspective you know, we tend to skew more towards the modier firms because it, it tends to be more in the wheelhouse of the clients that we serve. Interesting. What other value investing concepts play a role for Morningstar? I think Morningstar historically has been a bit more value oriented. I mean, the, the, the concept of economic mode actually comes from Warren Buffett. You know, it was, it was a phrase that he threw out about. He wanted, you know, from his companies that he owned, he wanted to be a castle with a, with a, a, a wide moat around it. And you know, we took that sort of concept and applied it because it's it, it's very um, easy for people to grasp and understand. You know, sort of a defensible position for for an individual company. You know, and from our bent, <clears throat> you know, we're not we're not a sell side shop. We're not um, uh, incentivized to you know push stocks just from a trading perspective because we don't have a, a trading desk. Um, we're more true independent researchers, and I think there is a bit more of a value bent to how we look at things because we run these uh, discounted cash flow models uh, for all of the companies we cover. We have a very consistent methodology across the board, and what we're trying to do is you know, get um, investors into securities, good quality names at reasonable price points. You know, so we have an array of potential outcomes, you know, and an uncertainty rating that goes with that, and that sort of determines what sort of discount or margin of safety we'd expect or need to have to sort of recommend a stock at certain levels. So, you know, there is a lot of value built into sort of how we look at the world and how we recommend stocks overall. How do you define moats? 
Uh, moat is basically just that that sustainable competitive advantage. And you know, like I was saying, there's five different sources. It's you know, cost advantage, intangibles, uh, you know, efficient uh, uh, scale. Um, and, I'm, and I always blank out on this. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> but but I mean, there's 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 uh, network effect, and then um, I tend not to have a lot of these because most of my companies don't. But I mean, it's it, it's really we're looking at those sources of of moat and how how that helps the the company either have pricing power or have an ability to generate excess returns. You know, all over a longer period of time. And then we're going to look at their competitors and their subsets. So, for example, I covered the U.S.-based asset managers. So I'm not just looking at the 12 companies that I cover, but I'm looking at the broader universe of 150 companies. And it's sort of an advantage working at Morningstar because I have a lot of uh, good quality fund analysts that I can tap into to sort of get their insight on a lot of different companies and what they're doing and, and, and how they're attacking the market and how they're competing with you know, they're, they're publicly traded brethren. So, you know, a, a big focus on our part on really sort of digging down into, you know, what gives a company an advantage over their peers and whether or not it's sustainable over time. You know, with the asset managers, I mean, be, you know, the, the two big um, <clears throat> uh, drivers of uh, moat tend to be switching costs and intangible assets. Um, switching costs is kind of inherent in the business overall when you look at annual redemption rates. Um, they've been about, you know, 25, 30 percent historically, you know, for, for U.S. based asset managers. Most of the companies I cover are lower than that. Um, and, you know, when we look at switching costs overall, we're, we're also sort of looking at organic growth. Are they not only retaining on assets longer, or retaining on clients longer, but are they also growing the book of business? So, you know, from that perspective, that's important. And then the intangibles is really you know, it's the identity, it's it's the branding, it's the quality of the firm, the reputation, you know, a lot of sort of qualitative aspects of the business, you know, and, you know, as analysts, we're always looking at things quantitatively, but it's also important to sort of look at the qualitative aspects and try to rank them you know, within the organizations. Yeah, when we talk about this specific mode, like brand, um, I, in my mind comes Kraft Heinz at yeah. Berkshire, yeah. Um, where we maybe see uh, a change in the economic mode. Maybe it gets a bit smaller. Or how do you think about? Well, it? we've already we've already reduced the. I think it's no mode at this point. It's already been reduced down um, by our analysts. But I think I think the interesting thing is we my background covering packaged goods. Um, there's always conversation around around this, and I've always tried to figure out is is there a way for me to ask a, a good question at the annual meeting that sort of speaks to this because you know I'm of an age demographic that grew up with a lot of you know branded products and what I would call sort of the baby boomer branded you know product, and it seems to me the more and more I look at it, it's that that branding power is diminishing because it's not as important to the next generation, the Gen X or the millennial uh, that are coming up um, 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 through the economy. And <clears throat> you know, the question is, how long does brand power really last? And is it, and is it really as effective as it used to be? You know, I mean, if you look at uh, retail supermarkets, for example, which is really where Kraft Heinz competes, it's a lot tougher to get pricing power than it maybe was 20 years ago. You know, at the onset, you're competing against the private label operators, you know, that are, you know, the own store themselves or they, they license it out. And in a lot of cases, you're up against private companies who have a different profit motive or a different incentive. You know, and, and you, you may need to generate 18 or 20 percent operating margins. They may be happy with 10. So it's, it's, it's a much, much tougher environment for them to compete in. And I think brands, brands really work and really build pricing power, I think, where you have a niche. You know, and where there aren't as much competitors overall to sort of nibble away at that advantage. So your advice would be if we look at a consumer good uh, company like Unilever or Nestle, that maybe in the long term, about 20 or 30 years, we should uh, be aware of a reversion to the mean in terms of I, EBIT margins it, I because think, of this? Yeah, I think, I, mean, I think our consumer analysts would agree with this. I, I, th I think in a lot of ways what you need to focus on are firms that are embracing the change in their marketplace and embracing uh, the brand shift that's taking place. So they're willing to, to fold in you know, newer businesses or newer ideas. 
I mean, it's the same thing with the asset managers because we talk about it at the same time too. I mean, I think I think the four sort of traits that we look at with the asset managers probably holds true for a lot of other companies. You know, because basically we're looking at differentiation, cost competitiveness, um, repeatable investment processes, which is not necessarily the same thing for for a lot of other firms, but then also adaptable business models. Um, and you know, for for an asset manager, I think the hardest one of those four to alter, to change, is the adaptable business model because culture is a really difficult thing to change. And when you have a people business like asset management or some of the financial services, it's a lot more difficult. I think with packaged goods firms, you know, it's easier to sort of move into that adaptable business model. I think the harder part for them is the differentiation. On the asset managers, mm -hmm. what are outstanding asset managers in the US you're covering? Oh, that I cover, I mean, I cover tw the 12 largest US-based firms and uh, traditionally for long-term investors, I recommend just BlackRock and T-Row Price. You know, I think it's a lot harder. Um, I, I, I look at the rest of the group as being more investable when they get cheap enough and it's, it's more of a trading idea as opposed to a long-term um, um, hold. I mean, with, with BlackRock and T-Row, I, I know what the headwinds are but I also know what the tailwinds are. They're going to be able to, to get them past the headwinds that the industry is facing overall. What Maybe. are both? Okay. Headwinds and tailwinds, what are they? Uh, on the headwind side, I mean, you've, you, you definitely have the pressure of, of um, uh, continued growth of passive. You've got uh, investors looking for better products and, and better fee structures. You've got the potential for fee and margin pressure overall on the industry. Um, and it, from a cyclical perspective, you've, you know, we're, we're getting into this phase now where it is likelihood to be a slowdown, if not a recession, you know, in the, in the U.S. market at some point, which will also prompt a, a downturn in the markets overall. So this run that we've had on the bull market for the past 10 plus years, I mean, that's been easier for the equity heavy guys who have been getting priced out on parts of the market by cheap ETFs to still grow their book because the markets continued to rise. So even if they had outflows, they were still seeing you know, record levels of AUM year after year after year. But if we go into a prolonged market downturn, it's a lot harder for them to generate the same level of profitability that they had previously. Um, as far as the tailwinds go, there aren't a whole lot for a lot of the you know, more traditional active asset managers. Um, there are some players out there that aren't necessarily public that are still good shops. I mean, Dodge and Cox is a fantastic uh, equity shop, still getting you know, inflows and still a good business. And if it was public, I'd want to own it. But <clears throat> you know, overall, you know, if you don't have passive products in your portfolio, you know, you're, you're struggling to find organic growth. And the market overall rewards both organic growth and, and higher levels of profitability. And that's why T. Rowe and, and BlackRock sort of get put in this different category because they have a little bit of both. Um, you know, for BlackRock, it's, it's the ETF business. I mean, passive products is about two thirds of their product set overall. You know, iShares is, is growing at this point, you know, high single to low double digits on an organic growth basis. And, you, you know, that's relative to passive products, just index based products growing at around seven, eight, and then, you know, active products over, you know, on the equity side at negative two to 4%. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a much better position to be in overall. Um, so I know where that's coming from. And when I modeled the company out over five and 10 years, just because of the shift in product mix and the continued growth of ETFs, they're the only company where I actually see potential for you know, fee stability, if not fee improvement and margin stability and improvement over time. Everybody else I've got modeled in fee and margin compression. You know, and it really depends on sort of your, your product set as to how exposed you are to sort of what's coming down the pike. Um, T. Rowe is, is equity heavy and it is also active, but T. Rowe has bucked the trend mainly because they have some of the best performance in the industry, upper quartile performers, every time frame you go back historically year after year after year for, you know, 20, 30 years, um, they have a good process. You know, they, they, they believe in uh, shooting for better investment returns as opposed to just gathering assets. You know, so they incentivize their managers to do the right things for the long run. And, you know, they pay them you know, on a you know, three and five year return basis. You know, they're looking at um, uh, size of the fund to make sure it's manageable and it's not getting too big in size. 
And then, you know, they also have a good development program internally, and they have a mandatory retirement age for, for a lot of their managers. So they definitely continue to move, and they have a process, and they stick to it. And that's really helped them over the long run, um, where a lot of other asset managers have struggled. So from that perspective, you know, on the tailwind side, <clears throat> you know, they have, they have some headwinds, you know, not necessarily the industry factor, because about two-thirds of their business is retirement-based. But, you know, right now, as we look at it, you know, they, they potentially have, you know, some headwinds from continued outflows for baby boomers because we're in that phase where they're retiring. So a lot of a lot more money is coming out of 401k plans than is going in. But, <clears throat> you know, in the meantime, what they've been doing is trying to access distribution on the retail side of the business. And they've, they've found a moderate amount of success, success there. Uh, and we think that probably over the next five to 10 years, at least in the next five years, they're going to do about a one to 3% positive organic growth, which is pretty good, um, you know, for an active equity manager. And then by 2025, the baby boomers, you know, the millennials will have caught up on a, a earnings perspective and they'll start to compensate for the outflows coming from the baby boomers. So we'll start to see some positive shift there. So probably by the end of a 10 year time frame, we'll be up to sort of a mid single digit sort of organic growth rate. You know, and again, for the rest of the industry, I, I struggle to kind of see that kind of growth. Thank you very much for the first part of our interview. Happy to get back to Berkshire in the second part of the interview. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.